I suffer from a condition called Charles Bonnet syndrome, or visual release hallucinations if you want to get more technical. It's a condition that's far more common than you might realize. It's estimated that half as many people with gradual loss of vision will experience one or more bouts over their lifetime. Yet I'm willing to bet that most of you have never heard of it. The reason for that is because most sufferers are scared to tell anyone what we experience. I know I was. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My name is Andrew and I am 26. Two years ago, I woke up with awful blurred vision. Every single edge and every detail clouded if someone had smeared Vaseline on a camera lens. It never got better. I was scared then, and I got over to Dr. Harper's surgery as fast as I could. Suddenly needing to take a cab rather than climb in the car I've driven without incident ever since I bought it three years prior. The doctor did some tests, asked me some questions. Have you been much thirstier lately? How often do you urinate? How would you describe your tiredless levels? And then he gave me the diagnosis that changed my life forever. Diabetes. Type 1. He explained that I would need to take insulin shots with every meal. That eating the wrong foods without monitoring my blood sugar could see me drop into a coma. Or worse. Then he got to my eyes. Andrew. Your diabetes has resulted in maculopathy. Do you know what that is? I shook my head dumbly, already reeling with the shock of my diagnosis, and Dr. Harper went on. It's when diabetes affects the blood vessels at the back of your eye, blocking them and causing them to leak into the macula, the center part of your retina that helps you perceive color and fine detail. When these blood vessels leak into the macula, it can cause significant damage. With a lump in my throat, I asked, Okay, so how do we make this better? I couldn't see Harper's face properly when he spoke, but his tone of voice was enough to tell me what I have been dreading. I'm sorry, Andrew, he replied gravely. Perhaps if we caught this sooner, we might have had some treatment options available to us. But I'm afraid the damage has been pretty extensive. We can take steps to arrest the development of the condition, but I'm afraid it's irreversible. I felt as if my world came crashing down around me. I was just 24, still at my physical peak. I was active, playing basketball, cycling multiple times a week, and now my health, my body and my sight had been taken from me. The first six months were tough. I broke up with my girlfriend, a sweet girl called Holly who tried to make it work, but couldn't because I was just too damn angry all the time. I lost my job. Because if there's one thing an architect needs, it's his eyes. I even fell out with a lot of my friends, making excuses to not meet up with them until they stopped asking. In truth, it was jealousy on my part, envy that they got to keep on living while everything I had hoped for had been snatched away. I became a recluse, never leaving my apartment, barely bothering to wash, shave, or even get dressed each day. I was so sure that my life was over, I stopped even trying to live it. I was an asshole. It took me a long time to realize this, but in the end, it was the nurse assigned to visit me at home, a tall, no-nonsense experienced woman called Lois, who brought this all to my attention. You're an asshole, she said. What? I gasped at her language. So you've got diabetes. Do you know how many people do? She asked. Then waiting for my answer, she continued. Do you think they all hide in their apartments, refusing to get on with their lives? Losing your vision is a terrible thing, and you do have my sympathy. But Andrew, it's no excuse to give up. But you don't, I argued, trying to defend myself, but she hadn't finished. Understand? She growled. One of the bravest men I know was paralyzed from the neck down when he was just a child, and he hasn't given up. You can do so much more with your life, and you have people that want to help you do that. But you can't even be bothered to shave that ugly fucking beard off. Stop being a crybaby and make a fucking difference. Of course, it didn't happen overnight, and I argued with her. 
I was furious at her blunt insensitivity and told her to leave. I said I'd tell her superiors, but she laughed at me and said, I wouldn't. You won't because you're a smart guy and you've got too much pride for that, she said. I'll see you next week. That night I shaved. I opened my curtains and looked around. Things were blurry, but when I really looked, I could see things scattered around my home. The mess I'd let it become. When Lois came back the following week, the place was tidy. I was clean shaven, dressed. I even attempted to comb my hair. She didn't say anything about it, didn't mention the argument of the week before, but she took me out for coffee down the street. She guided me along the sidewalk to the coffee shop, talking to me, reassuring me. It was daunting, and even though it was less than a block away, I felt so proud when I got there. We talked, me and Lois. I even think I laughed. Afterwards, she walked me home. Then, she helped me back inside and she said, It's nice to meet you, at last, Andrew. That day was the beginning of my new life. I moved to a new apartment, a ground floor place, and joined a group of other young people with visual impairments. I made friends. I got out every day, even if it was just a short walk, but I made a point of seeing what I could of the world. I bought what I could, but the Sawyers, the old couple that ran the local store, would bring my groceries by once a week. Clark's a gruff old coot, so he refuses to coddle me, but he's told me that he respects me for being like I am, for maintaining my independence, for not giving up. From a guy like him, that's one of the sweetest things I have ever heard. Things were going so well, and then, one year ago, it started. I walked into my living room, a mug of coffee in my hand, and I saw a Victorian funeral carriage stood right there on my rug, complete with two huge, proud horses in full livery, adorned with long black plumes in their bridles. They stood perfectly still, while the driver, a small bearded man in a period costume and a top hat, fidgeted with the reins and peered at me expectantly. Bizarrely, they were far clearer than the usual blurry shapes that I could see. I damn near pissed my pants. I dropped the cup, spilling scalding hot coffee all over my feet, jumping backwards with a cry of pain and alarm. When I returned my attention to the horses and carriage back in the room, they were gone. At that moment, I wondered if I was going mad. Apparently, most of us do, which is understandable. How would you feel if you'd seen the exact same sight in your home? Unless you're Jack the Ripper, I imagine many of you do not have a coach and horses just lying around. I certainly didn't. Eventually, after a much quiet swearing to myself, and more than a little self-delusion, I managed to convince myself that I had not seen what I thought I had, that I merely was having a very vivid daydream. This seemed to work and I got on with living, even if I entered the same room a little more cautiously in the next days that followed. Finally, I forgot about it. Two weeks later, I saw a giant, floating, swirling, orange ball in my bathroom. I damn near pissed myself again. I stood staring at it, this bizarre, rotating, levitating globe that was larger than a beach ball, hanging in midair over my bathtub. My mouth opened for a full 10 seconds before finally screwing my eyelids tightly closed and whispering to myself, that isn't there, that isn't there. After five seconds, I opened my eyes again. It wasn't there. Have you ever had cause to doubt your own sanity? To wonder whether what you perceived is truly there or if your mind has betrayed you? Honestly, compared to my loss of vision, the prospect of losing my wits was much more terrifying. I fought against adversity and took pride in the fact that I am not a survivor, but someone who is living his own life. How could I do that if I was insane? I barely slept that night, and I remained jumpy for days afterwards. Any sign of movement or any unfamiliar shape would set my pulse racing, would cause me to doubt whether it was truly there. It was the toughest time I had ever been through, 
Worse than that time, I was diagnosed with diabetes. At least when Dr. Harper told me about the diabetes, I had a definitive prognosis. I was given facts by a medical professional. My affliction was physical, it had a name, and, most important, it had a treatment plan. This was something else. My mind turned against me. My senses and perception of reality became twisted and unreliable. It's only when you're in that position that you realize how terrifying it is. Your senses, and the way in which your brain interprets them, are your only true defenses against danger. You perceive danger, and you avoid it, preventing your body from becoming harm. But what happens when you can't trust your perception to alert you to the dangers that are truly there? Lois picked up the problem first, noticing my skittish manner. She asked what was wrong, if I needed to talk about anything, but I told her no. I was fine and I hadn't been sleeping well. The last part was true. I hadn't been able to sleep a wink. Just the very thought of being institutionalized, spending the rest of my days sedated, blue pajamas clad zombie in a white room with only the echoes of my fellow inmates for company, terrified me beyond any measure. But what was the alternative? Live life as a risk to myself and others? Ultimately, I chose to ignore it. I reasoned that if I was able to function around other people without them realizing what was going on, that was good enough. A full month passed before the next incident, and I really did think that maybe I'd put this whole mess behind me. With every passing day, my confidence had grown. So that Wednesday morning, I'd step out onto a sunny street, feeling pretty carefree. Each Wednesday, I'd treat myself to a latte down at Joe's, the same coffee shop that I had visited with Lois. It was a custom that had given me a great deal of pleasure. One that had seen me forge friendships with other regulars as well as the staff, including Joe himself. As I made my way down the street, white stick in hand, I glanced about me, taking in the colors and shapes of the world around me. I enjoyed feeling the sun on my face, and the sounds of the birds singing. It was a good day. Then I saw them. A party of pilgrims, six of them, all dressed in settler area attire, sitting cross-legged on the asphalt. They didn't look at me. Instead, they were engaged in a heated, yet strangely silent conversation. I froze, staring at them. Still they argued, gesticulating furiously at one another. However, I couldn't hear their angry voices, despite the fact that, judging by their ill temperament, they must be screaming at one another. Paralyzed by shock, the white stick fell from my numb fingers, clattering onto the sidewalk. I turned to leave, desperate to flee from the haunting sight of the colonists in the road but I was so panicked, in such a hurry, that I stepped on my cane. It rolled underfoot and before I knew it, it pitched over, tumbling to the ground hard below. It didn't quite break my fall in time, banging my cheek hard on the floor and skinning my palms. I heard a cry from a nearby passerby, a friendly concerned woman who rushed to my side. She knelt beside me, helping me up applying a Kleenex to my throbbing cheek which she informed me was now bleeding. I tried to tell her that I was okay, there was nothing to worry about, but this good Samaritan insisted on driving me to Dr. Harper's office to get my injuries looked at. Now I think back to it, I'm pretty sure that she knew my obvious distress was nothing to do with the fall. At the time I was embarrassed and angry, but I now realize I owe her a debt of gratitude. Without her intervention, I don't know how much longer this would have gone on before I cracked up and ended up in an asylum after breaking down through sheer stress. Andrew, why don't you tell me what happened? Dr. Harper asked, gently dabbing at my cheek with disinfectant. I explained that I'd just lost my balance and that no harm was done, but I think he saw through my feeble protestations to my underlying agitation. He didn't press or force the matter. He simply asked what might have caused my clumsiness. Then he asked how I'd been as of late. When I'd finished mumbling my way through the most non-committal answer I could muster, 
He placed a gentle, reassuring hand on my shoulder. Andrew, he repeated gently, why don't you tell me what happened? I burst into tears. I told him how scared I was, how I fought so hard for my independence, and now I knew it would be taken from me. He listened patiently and then asked me to tell him why I even thought that. I paused then, took a deep breath and thought about it. This was the point of no return. But really, what other option did I have? So with tears running down my cheeks, I told Dr. Harper everything. I told him about the horse in the carriage, the orange globe and the pilgrims. I told him how I had been living each day in fear, how I was terrified that I was losing my mind. Dr. Harper thought for a while and then said, Andrew, I don't think you are losing your mind. The sense of relief at that moment was so powerful, it overwhelmed me, rendering me speechless. You say that even though you've seen these things, you've never heard any noise from them? Have you detected any odors or experienced any other physical sensations, such as touching them? I shook my head no, and he patted my shoulder once again. Andrew, have you heard of Charles Bonnet syndrome? He asked. Charles Bonnet who? I asked, confused by this sudden unexpected turn of conversation. Okay. Let me explain, Dr. Harper said kindly. Charles Bonnet was a Swiss naturalist who was born in the 1700s. He discovered a curious condition in his elderly grandfather, who was nearly completely blind due to cataracts. The old man regularly experienced visual hallucinations, including random patterns and even people and places. Sound familiar? Yes, I replied, still confused. Am I suffering from dementia? No, Andrew, not at all, Dr. Harper reassured me. Do you know how perception works? In layman's terms, your eyes take in light via the iris and pupil, which is then processed via the retina and translated into electrical signals which are decoded by the brain, which simply organizes these signals into a recognizable image. Are you with me so far? I nodded finally starting to understand. When the retina becomes damaged, such as those that have undergone immacular degeneration, those signals become warped and jumbled. Dr. Harper went on. The brain still receives them, so it does its job. Translating these distorted signals into an image, it kind of fills in the gaps for you. Sometimes it fills these gaps with colors, patterns, creatures, in places that aren't present, and this is called Charles Bonnet Syndrome. I nearly wept with relief. So I'm not mad? I cried. Not at all, the doctor replied. This is an entirely physical condition. Your mind is in full working order. If you were suffering from any form of mental illness, your delusions wouldn't be limited to just one sense. You'd hear these interlopers, smell them, even feel them. This condition is solely related to your eyes, not your brain. As I left Dr. Harper's office, I felt as if a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Sure, my vision was still an issue, but now I knew it was not only a problem with my eyes, not my mind. I knew I could handle the situation. I was ready to face the world once again. Since then, I've seen pretty weird visions. I saw a huge waterfall in the park complete with hazy mist and butterflies fitting around it. I saw a Native American warrior, complete with a huge feather headdress, sitting at a stool in a countertop at the coffee shop. I saw an intricate and quite impossible structure of scaffolding crisscrossing the entire front of my apartment block. Hell, on the 4th of July last year, I even saw a great swooping green dragon in the sky, twisting and cavorting through the air overhead. All looked utterly and completely real, yet, now I knew they were simple tricks of the eye, they were no longer disturbing. In fact, I actually came to quite enjoy them, even looking at them as unique and entertaining little shows or works of art that existed purely for my pleasure and nobody else's. I came to welcome them. Then a month ago, I saw her. It was nighttime. 
It's always nighttime when I see her, and I was just getting ready for bed. I walked into the kitchen to get myself a glass of water, and actually cried out in alarm when I spotted a figure in the corner. She was tall, by far the tallest woman I had ever seen, and even though she stood hunched, she had at least six inches of height on me. I was used to seeing characters in dated and bizarre dress, but this was somehow different. It didn't seem like an outfit from any one time, instead a bizarre mishmash of items. She wore a tuxedo jacket, figure hugging in black, tailored to the female body shape, over a dirty ruffled dress shirt. To complete the ensemble, she wore a bright red bow tie. On her hands, which she held out on either side as if shrugging, or maybe feeling for rain, she wore dirty white gloves. Her fingers were disproportionately long, almost spidery, and occasionally they twitched, as if she longed to grip and squeeze something in them. On her lower half, she wore shorts, the same crimson as her bow tie, over opaque black nylons. Her legs were long, attractive, truth be told, the legs of a dancer. She also wore red heels, the same hue as her shorts and bow tie, but they sparkled and shimmered, bringing to mind Judy Garland's ruby slippers from The Wizard of Oz. As strange as this ensemble was, I couldn't tear my eyes from her face. Most of it was obscured by a jaunty bowler hat, tipped and tilted to hide her eyes and nose. But beneath the brim of her hat, I could see the deathly pale skin of her face and a grin that sent shivers down my spine. It was wide, too wide, with entirely too many teeth. A smile is meant to be an expression of warmth. It's meant to feel welcoming and benevolent. But the look on this woman's face oozed malice. It felt like the sort of glee I'd expect from a snake as it corners a rat. However, the thing that startled me the most was that she had a third arm sprouting from her back, curled up and over her head like a scorpion's tail. It was longer than any arm should be, and the hand only had three fingers like a claw. It was pointed straight at me, and as I swore in dismay and stumbled sideways, it seemed to track my movement. I stood staring at the creepy figure for a few seconds, trying to get my head around the situation. She stood there in the corner, grinning back. Finally, I realized this was just another of my hallucinations and breathed an audible sigh of relief. One of the many tricks I picked up over the months of suffering from Charles Bonnet syndrome is to break the line of vision toward whichever stimulus is causing my brain to interpret the images into hallucination. Think of it like restarting a faulty computer, how refreshing the system debugs it. To this end, I closed my eyes and count to five. Then, when I reopened them, the hallucination was gone. So, as I stared at the horrifying, malformed figure in my kitchen, I knew that to make the image go away, I simply had to close my eyes. I'll be honest here. When I counted to five, I hesitated a little before opening my eyes. If I opened my eyes and she still had stood there, smiling that wicked smile at me, I think I might have had a heart attack. She wasn't, and I breathed another long sigh of relief, fetched my glass of water, and went back to bed. The tall woman haunted my thoughts in the days after I saw her. She was different from the other visions I'd had. Somehow, she had felt more real. It was this agitation that my buddy Jason picked up on when we met for lunch the following Friday. Jason was one of those same friends I tried to drive away shortly after I lost my vision, yet he'd refused to give up on me, continuing to get in touch week after week. Good friends are hard to come by, but great friends, the ones who will be by your side for life, are even rarer. Jason, God bless his kind heart, is one of the latter. You've got to tell me what's going on, dude, he said, as we sat down over pizza. What do you mean? I asked, trying to brush it off. You're so distracted. It's like you're looking for something in here all the time. 
you've eaten like one slice of pizza in the time it's taken for me to eat four. So, I repeat, you've got to tell me what is going on, Jason said, waving a slice of pizza around for emphasis. It's nothing, I replied, feeling a little stupid. I just had a hallucination a couple nights ago that really got to me. I thought you were cool with those now, he asked, putting the pizza slice down. Y yeah, I am. I mean, I was, but this one was different, I replied, resigned to talking about it. She scared me. She? Jason asked, his interest clearly piqued. Tell me about it. So I did. I described the tall woman and how she appeared to me. I explained that unlike any of my other hallucinations, she felt more real, and that she was the first to feature such a weird and unsettling mutation. Sure, I'd seen similar versions of people in the past, a phenomenon referred to as Lepichin by a medical professionals, but the extra appendage and the impossibly distorted face were something I had yet to encounter thus far. I think it was that, combined with the unnerving expectant stance, that had me disturbed the most. So, Jason said after I'd finished, you said she had great legs? Shut up, asshole. I laughed, throwing my napkin at him. No, seriously, I get it, man, Jason replied, passing the napkin back to me. If I walked into a room and a giant mutant was waiting for me, it'd scare the shit out of me, too. But you know what caused you to see this? It's like a coachman in that waterfall you saw. It's a condition that you know you have, and it's one that you know how to deal with, okay? I know, I know, I replied. Thanks, man. You're right. I did feel better, too, so I smiled at him and took a big bite of my pizza and changed the subject, asking him about his psycho ex, a conversation he was all too happy to dive into. The next time I saw the tall woman, just under a week later, I was brushing my teeth. I was stood at the wash bin brushing away when I spotted a figure in my mirror. She was out in the dark hallway, peeking around the door behind me. The same sinister grin I'd seen before stretched her narrow face into a distorted grimace. The dirty bowler hat pushed down over her eyes once again. Each one of those three long spidery hands gripped the door frame. As crazy as this sounds, it felt like she was trying to avoid being spotted. I cried out, spitting toothpaste foam all over the mirror. My toothbrush clattered into the basin. I spun around, my heart thumping in my chest, breathing ragged in my throat. She wasn't there. Of course she wasn't. The doorway was empty. I tiptoed forward hesitantly, trying to look around the doorframe into the hallway without sticking my neck out of its shadowy confines. The seconds ticked as I grew closer and closer. I couldn't see anything, so finally, with a whimper of self-affirmation, I stepped out of the bathroom. The hallway was empty, as was the rest of the apartment. I was shaken again. This time was the first time I'd seen a hallucination in a reflection and I wasn't even sure that I'd actually seen it. Now as I sit here writing this, knowing what would follow, I think I'd like to try to protect myself, to shield myself from the truth. I was an idiot. A full fortnight passed without incident. Sure, I saw a flash of color one day, a dancing yellow lightning bolt that zigzagged back and forth on the street outside my apartment but that was exactly the sort of thing I had come to expect from my condition. It was exciting, otherworldly, but it wasn't scary, not like she was. In retrospect, that fortnight was blissful. It was a reminder of what life could be like, the existence that I'd carved out for myself since my diagnosis. Life was good. The night that changed the way I viewed the tall woman, last night, I'd been out and had a couple of drinks. I'd met the other guys with visual impairment for dinner, and we ended up at a bar afterwards. I wasn't hammered, but we got through plenty of beer between us, and by the time I stepped out into the cool night air, I felt decidedly lightheaded. It took me a while to make it home, laughing and talking to a couple of the other guys from our group as we strolled along. It had been a great evening. 
it was probably the last truly good one I'll ever have. I bid the others a good night and fumbling with my key, let myself in. With swaying steps, I strolled into my hallway, slamming the door a little too loud behind me. I took my jacket off, hung it on the hook by the door, and then hit the light switch. She was waiting at the end of the hallway, all three hands held aloft into claws, reaching for me. The same maddening malevolent grin on her pale face. I swore again, louder than ever, actually jumping back a step, recoiling from the impossibly tall and terrifying figure lying wait in my own home. The tall woman didn't move. She just stood there, staring and smiling at me. I stared back, but I sure as hell didn't smile. Jesus Christ, I muttered under my breath. You know how you can feel a little paranoid after a few beers? The feeling of non-specific post-alcohol dread? Imagine that combined with a giant, grinning mutant woman suddenly appearing in your home. I suffice to say it, it was very, very, very uncool. I don't need this, I sighed and closed my eyes. One, two, three, four, five. When I opened my eyes, her face was just a foot from my own, grinning wider than ever. She dashed the length of the hallway and was now stood so close that her long grasping arms were on either side of me, her fingers twitching and clawing at the air around my face. I could see her chest heaving as if she were actually silently laughing at my attempts to dismiss her. As if the thought that I could ever be free of her was amusing. I screamed a full body shriek of terror and actually dropped to my knees, covering my head as if to fend off an expectant blow. It never came. Finally, I lowered my hands, gasping for breath, shaking. The hallway was empty. The tall woman, nowhere to be seen. I stayed there on my knees for a moment, gasping for breath. Then I was on my feet and I turned and ran, out of the apartment, out of the building, and onto the street. I stood there, shivering, terrified beyond reason, without a clue as to what to do next. Finally, I pulled my phone out of my pocket and I made a phone call. Hey Andy. What's up? Jason asked. Jason, I need you to come here, I said. Jason didn't ask why, didn't complain. Instead, he simply replied, I'm on my way. Less than 20 minutes later, his car pulled up outside and he dashed over the steps outside my building where I was sitting, shivering. He threw his jacket around my shoulders and asked what had happened. His voice filled with concern. She, she's in there, I stammered. The tall woman, she's back. Okay, okay, he said, gently helping me to my feet. Come on, man, let's go in there and check it out. I wish I could say that I was brave when we went inside, but I'd be lying. I was cowering behind Jason, one hand on his shoulder as we made our way through my home. Of course, we didn't find a thing. We were talking about a giant mutant woman in a pokey little one-bed apartment. Where the hell was she going to hide? Finally, after we checked every single room twice, I had to admit that she was gone. I'm so sorry, man. I apologized feeling genuinely stupid. I got scared, and I'm sorry, man. Hey, forget about it, buddy, Jason said. So I'm here now. Where do you keep your booze? Half a bottle of bourbon later, we were both feeling pretty talkative. She's, you know, just kind of different, you know? I tried to explain. I get it. I get it, he said. It's like you said. You saw something bad and you feel bad. That's bad. He didn't get it. No, she's different, you know, I explained. I've never had a repeat hallucination before, and they've never been scary, you know. She's not like the others. Dude, Jason said, taking another sip of bourbon. You've got, like, Charlie Bonnie syndrome or something? And you know that makes you see shit, so... He waved his hands in the air like a magician who just performed a trick. I know. I know, I replied. 
No, listen, Andy, he said. You know what makes you see shit? It's just your eyes, yeah? You didn't hear anything. You didn't feel anything. This is just how stuff goes. It's your eyes. And I know it's scary, man. But you've been through, like, hell and high water in your life so far? You're tough. One of the toughest, bravest guys I know. And you can handle some creepy hallucination, bitch. I laughed. I couldn't help it. She is a very creepy hallucination bitch though, dude. He laughed and we both took a sip of our drink. You know what? That could help, he said finally, his voice thoughtful. What, drinking? I asked. No, well, yes it does, he giggled. I mean like demystifying her. You should give her a name, something stupid so she's not scary. I've got to say, that as much as I like creepy hallucination bitch, that's a bit of a mouthful, I laughed. Y yeah, I get it, he replied. Suddenly something came back to me. How about Helen, I suggested. Helen Highwater. Awesome, he said. Then raising his glass, here's to Helen, buddy. To Helen. I smiled and drained my glass. Jason spent the night on my sofa, mainly because he had had too much to drink to even think about getting behind the wheel of a vehicle. But honestly, I think the reason he drank so much was so he'd have an excuse to stay and keep an eye on me. I'm glad he did. Knowing that he was there made me feel safer and I was able to get some sleep. It gave me a sense of security to know that if the strange vision I had just christened as Helen was to appear again, I'd be able to call on him for support. This morning, we both needed support. It feels like a mule kicked me in the head. He groaned when he made his way into the living room. Yup, I replied, my own head thumping. Joe's? Joe's, he replied firmly, and staggered to his feet. As we drank strong black coffee and ate muffins, we didn't talk much. Finally, Jason broke the silence. Do you feel cool now, he asked, his mouth still full of blueberry muffin. I nodded. Yeah, I think so. Not still freaked out by uh, you know who, he asked. Helen, I replied with a smile. No, I really don't think I am. I reckon I can handle some creepy hallucination, bitch. Good, he laughed, giving me a hearty part on the back. That's cool, man. I bet you can. Now as I sit here cowering in my bathroom, too scared to go out into my apartment, I knew we were both wrong. About everything. I remember how earlier I told you the thought of being institutionalized, the very idea of losing my grasp on reality was the most terrifying thing I could imagine. Now, I'd welcome that because the alternative is far, far worse. After breakfast, I said goodbye to Jason and he climbed into his car and drove away. The day passed without incident and when Lois stopped by this afternoon, she even commented on how upbeat I seemed. You got a lady in your life, she asked casually. I laughed at that, wondering what she'd think if she knew the truth. Yeah, I chuckled. Something like that. Good for you, she sniffed. You make sure you treat her right. That tickled me even more, and I had to bite my lip. Sure, I replied. I'll do my best. Tonight, still a little wiped from my excursions of the previous evening, I decided to turn in early. I brushed my teeth washed my hands and face and got changed. Finally, I fetched a glass of water and walked into my bedroom. I climbed into bed and instantly felt so relaxed. Within a mere seconds, I was ready for sleep. That sudden overwhelming drowsiness that comes when you've spent the whole day keeping sleep at bay. I decided that resistance was futile and sat up and switched off the light. I nearly didn't see her, but as I reached for the switch, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. My heart leapt into my throat as I turned to the foot of my bed. The tall woman was crouching there, her face grinning, staring at me from just beyond my feet. So many teeth. Her long, slender fingers spread out over my blankets, twitching slightly as she gripped the end of the bed. Slowly, excruciatingly so. Her third misshapen arm came into view over her shoulder, joining her other hands on my bedding. I froze, 
utterly petrified. I was at a crossroads here, arriving at a pivotal moment that had been coming for some time. But this time, I'd had enough. You don't scare me anymore, I said, my voice filled with defiance and anger. I'm not letting you do this to me. I reached across to the light switch. Good night, Helen, I said triumphantly, then flicked it, plunging the room into darkness. I laid there as a sense of tremendous pride surged through me and grinned to myself in my warm, comfortable bed, overjoyed at the emotional victory of overcoming my own fear. And then it happened. The thing that led me here, something that turned my blood to ice water and my bowels to jelly. Good night, Andrew. A raspy voice hissed from the darkness.